welcome everyone. Uh, we do have uh, viewers online as well as in person. So this is a hybrid this evening. And uh, we um, question and answer if uh, we'll kind of do that as, as we go along. Yeah. And um, yeah. if anybody has a question yeah. here in person, uh, Mike will just repeat it for uh, viewers at on devices. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if you are on a device, please feel free to add your questions into the Q&A or the chat. And uh, let's see, on Zoom, we've enabled the live transcript option. And so if you would like to disable the words at the bottom of your screen, click on closed captioning or click on more and then select hide subtitles. And in the library, we have our assisted listening system. And uh, it's really easy to use. If you'd like to borrow one, come see me in the back of the room. Please silence cell phones and any other devices. And then uh, one more thing to tell you about. So for those of us here in person, we do have a um, an online, uh, let's see here. It's, a, it's called a symphony of stories. The Common Connection is a series of programs using lectures, discussion, and critical thinking to identify topics that influence the world today. So this fall's topic is a symphony of stories and you can find events at elmlib.org slash common. And if you would like to join the Common Connection Program Challenge, you can earn a badge for attending this evening. And very easy, just scan the code on this sign. I'm gonna leave it up here. And, and now I will turn it over to Mike and Ben Pavlik. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So much. Thank you, Sue. Um, welcome. So my name is Mike Pavlik and I direct the band program at your community high school. And I've done that for 17 years. I've, this is my 27th year of teaching music and um, graduate of Elmhurst University, although I'll continue to call it Elmhurst College. And then I got a master's degree in Colorado, University of Northern Colorado with a degree in, in uh, conducting from that school. And so I've been invited uh, graciously by the library to to present on three different occasions, calling it a musical crash course. Uh, these three sessions are basically meant to give you just enough information about three different areas of music to kind of make it dangerous with the knowledge that you've got. Um, the first one was about conducting. Tonight was about songwriting, of course, and then the next one will be about the recording process. So if you, tonight, get excited, write your own song. The next session will be about your uh, approach to, to uh, recording and producing that song. Um, I've got my son Ben here tonight, who is, in my opinion, my humble opinion, is one of, is an incredibly fine songwriter. And so we'll have him uh, do some kind of a uh, I'll be interviewing him later on, and he'll be demonstrating some of the concepts that he utilizes in his songwriting process. So I think that'll be um, add a lot to tonight's performance or, or its uh, presentation. I'd like to start out by just talking about some vocabulary that we use in the musical world. Some of this stuff may be familiar with you, and some of it may not. Um, is this loud enough? Um, when it comes to, yeah, absolutely. In my opinion, again, I think the most powerful tool that a composer or a songwriter can employ is utilizing a good melody. Um, we were, my family and I just went to the, the Mozart uh, Amadeus concert at CYSO, I see a CYSO, CSO, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, where they provide the music for the soundtrack while the movie is playing. And Amadeus is about Amadeus, uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and his life. And um, what I bring up Mozart because of my, again, lots of opinions here. The way that he writes melodies or wrote melodies is just so elegantly beautiful and simple. Um, and it's those melodies that seem to transcend time. Um, we could talk about the music that we like today, popular music, and we can argue about it. 
but it, as I see it, we really can't talk about what's valuable music right today. We have to wait about 50 years and see what remains. And most often, what remains through time um, is good melody. So writing a good melody is something that's interesting. Constructing notes that when they're placed together, that they are um, singable, identifiable, memorable, um, that some, uh, a series of notes that are together that just uh, cause us to take notice. And um, we'll talk more later about uh, a term called a hook. We'll have dem Ben demonstrate some, some hooks as well, but they have to do with the melodic line. So a melodic line, series of notes that are pleasant to our ear, that makes sense. There is a, um, we might call a melody a musical sentence where it's complete. There's a, there, there, it might be actually two sentences. It might be an antecedent consequent phrase relationship where there's sort of a, So there's sort of a call and then an answer. Um, but that's, that's a melody. Um, of course, lyrics have to do with the words of a song. How many, if any of you written any lyrics or poetry? Yeah, awesome. So do you, do you write um, some, some of your own music? Great. And what, what instrument do you use to accompany yourself? So you use the piano. That's, that's wonderful. And we'll talk about tonight that if you are inspired to do some writing of lyrics, and you'd like to, uh, you know, if, if you're just, you catch yourself sort of singing melodies, there are apps that you can use on your phone to create what we're gonna talk about next, chords, so that those chords can accompany you in order to facilitate your lyrics and your songwriting process. Um, but if you're using piano, that's, that's fabulous. Chords are just a series of, of notes that are happening at the same time and sound pleasant together. And it'll sound better when Ben puts his mic on and then he'll sit up here on the stool and he'll play some chords for you as well. A chord progression is a series of chords that are put in such an arrangement that um, again, sounds pleasant to our ears. Um, we have a, what's called a music production program at York High School. And a music production program is basically music technology where you've got a computer and a piano keyboard and all of that's hooked up to facilitate a recording program that allows you to create your own music in layers where you can create one line of music that might be um, the, the drum track, and then another layer, which might be the bass, and then maybe you'll record a ukulele after that. And you can layer upon layer of these, um, using these types of programs. If you come back to the recording uh, session, you will we'll learn out about those types of programs. But what I'm getting at is that you don't need to have a lot of music theory knowledge. You don't have to know a lot about anything about music. And the classes at York are a beautiful illustration of something that I call learning music in reverse. In that a lot of times you'll set up to the computer and you'll, you'll start creating some music. Um, at that point, one of the teachers will come up to you and say, okay, this is really great. Do you see what you've done here? You've created a baseline that works really well with some of the chords that, that are present in a pre-recorded loop. And we're able to show students that there's all of this musical knowledge already here. So if you're here or at home and you are, you're, you're more than just wanting to know about this process, you're wanting to kind of dip your toe into the songwriting process, know that you've got everything you need in order to start the process. Um, we'll talk with Ben a little bit in a little bit about, Ben, once you have a seat here okay. and we'll get you set up on with the guitar and, and some of this other stuff. So Ben, can you, um, 
So play, play a couple of chords for us. What he just played for you right there is a pretty cool little chord progression. Can you play another progression of chords that maybe something that you've done before that sounds cool? Like yeah. One of your tunes. As you can hear, those chords are, there's a jazz influence to those chords. And one of the reasons that I've got Ben here tonight, um, Ben has what we call really big ears. Does anybody know what I'm talking about with that? There's, his ears are adorable on his head. <laughs> but we, when we say someone has big ears, it's that they can hear lots of different elements of, of a musical piece. It might, I could equate like, if you've ever been to the Art Institute and you've gone through one of the tours and there's an art, uh, someone who understands what's happening in the painting and they can, they can share with you all of these details, all these insights into the piece of art that you're looking at, Ben can do that with sound. And so there's this, when we say someone has big ears, there's this understanding of what they're hearing and how all of the parts fit together. And so he'll be able to illustrate some of that um, today as he pre presents as well. But in that first chord progression, you can hear that the chords that he's using are, they have an extra flavor to them because they are sort of a jazz influenced chords that um, are more complex. There are more colors within them. And um, that's, that's just his, interest, his, his own personal fingerprint on the music that he writes has, is flavored with those types of, of chords. Can you demonstrate when we talk about rhythm, he already plugged in sort of a rhythm to what he was playing there. It almost sounded like a bossa nova or a Latin sort of a pattern. Can you play a different type of rhythm from one of your tunes? It would be more of a rock oriented perhaps. Yeah. Um... Oh, whatever. Do, yeah. Right, right. Sounds like a Led Zeppelin tune um, or a country style tune. But plugging chords into a chord progression and then changing the rhythmic patterns that you're using. All of those things, you know, go into the, the songwriting formula. Um, musical style has to do with um, just understanding that there are a multitude of musical styles. Um, and you as a, a songwriter yourself will utilize the music that you, that's near and dear to your heart. Um, it, that's just the way it works. Um, if you listen to a lot of Led Zeppelin, if you listen to um, if you listen to folk music, if you listen to rap, if you listen to any sort of particular genre of music that you're drawn to, you'll find that as a songwriter, those, th those influences are going to be right there at the surface. So you might think you're, you know, if you start writing a song that's has, it's inspired by a beautiful walk down, um, you know, a, a fall seen uh, lovely trees and you're walking through the park and you're inspired by some lyrics and but when it comes to playing that music um you will find that your musical your your in, influences that you, of the musicians that you listen to will seep their way into your writing of music ben listens to a lot of jazz and of course and then well you know he listens to a lot of different stuff but that those musical influences kind of seep in. Would you want to talk about that just a little bit yeah. about like how just when you listen, I mean, yeah, to speak to that. Huh? Yeah. How do you influence? I mean, some people say soda and other people say pop. And I feel like it's kind of that same thing. Like you don't question it at the time. Then when you're around other people and they're saying soda and you say pop, 
then you're really like, oh yeah, like there's a different way to say the same thing. Yeah. And I feel like it's just, um, you, you talk about vocabulary and like when you're raised by your parents, hopefully you're raised by your parents and, um, you, you know, you pick up certain phrases they say, and it just be, kind of becomes your own vocabulary. And so a lot of like, really when people ask what defines a certain genre, like really the line is, the lines are kind of blurred except for like the, the vocabulary present. Like, it's like texting your friend versus texting your mom. Like when I text my mom, I use punctuation and like capitalize my stuff. When I'm texting my friends, I, I like, I don't really care. So it's kind of just the, the setting. And also there's a big cultural like thing that you have to you have to like respect the the culture and the the history of the music because that brings us to a lot of cultural appropriated like music and that that's just, that doesn't right withstand the test of time it really it's mm. like really Good um point. really kind of makes a, a bad taste in your mouth with some stuff um so and like a lot of people say blues originated from, you know, black people in the, the late 1800s, like, you know, from work songs and stuff, but actually like the Native American, indigenous American people were um, like sharing blues music, like the original kind of um, music. Um, and they got their vocabulary from birds and their geography around them. And when you listen to certain birds sing their song, there's a lot to learn. There's very repetitive. It's distinct. It follows a shape. And it's so that their like mate can find them and they can be distinct. So really it's like, it's intentional distinction of vocabulary that um, I guess in the long run makes a song of a certain genre. In style that's really well said yeah. yeah that's that's excellent yeah and those influences yeah absolutely can come from from anywhere and um yeah that's a good point um could you talk a little bit about like what what is a hook a hook is something that you whistle or you sing right the thing that gets stuck in your head and um when i sit down and write a song um, I perform in different bands, so I'm always trying to write something that's like fun for us to play. Um, but if I don't leave, if I don't go to bed and then wake up with the hook in my head, it's not catchy enough and I have to go back and revisit it. Um, it should, it should be like, you should lose track of time when you're involved in it. You're not thinking about anything else. It's, it's, it grabs your attention for the moment and that's a good hook and you know it's a bad hook if you start thinking of a different song midway through then mm -hmm. it's too similar and you got to tweak something yeah. your bird song is going to be too similar to something and you know you're ripping ripping off another bird um <laughs> and yeah so i was just got asked this question this morning um like what tips do you have for songwriting and I told them to finish the song, really sit with an idea. Like, even if it's just a, a chunk, if it's just, if you're just working on your hook, you, you got to say you finish the hook, you know, so you, there's a finality to it. Um, and then also there are a bunch of cliches out there with music that you can hear, you know, that's um, if, if you, if someone were to ask you to like play a rock song, you'd have some idea of what that is, you know? So there are these cliches. So I told this person this morning that use a cliche as a guideline and then tweak it around where it's your own. But definitely cliches are cliches for a reason because they're familiar. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that would be my advice on that. So like if you're wondering about a hook, maybe find three hooks you like and try combining them together. And chances are, it's gonna sound a little different. Yeah, so that hook would be, in our house, we call it an earworm. I think in German, it, there's, it burrows into your ear and you just can't get rid of it. That's, 
that's an effective hook. And as a songwriter, if you if you want your music to be remembered and played and and you know to to go on like we were talking before, sort of transcend time, those hooks are really a vital part of that process for sure. Exactly. I think that's Barry Manilow that came up with American Family Insurance. Exactly. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, commercials. Absolutely. If you're if you're a musician and marketing and you're writing music for commercials, um, writing a good hook is that just that little nugget that just as soon as you hear it, you're like, oh yeah, that's that insurance company. Oh yeah, I'm hungry for a Big Mac. Oh yeah, you know. That's 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 a big part of, of you know a successful song. So as you leave here today, I really you know I challenge you to as you're listening to pop stations, um, and you can listen to classical stations as well because there are hooks throughout history. Can you play a little bit of Beethoven Ninth? Yeah. Exactly. That's a hook. You know, it's one of the most famous hooks of all time, and that little nugget placed in different areas you hear it four notes and you know exactly what what it, you know where it's yeah. that's based on beethoven's ninth really yeah i have no idea okay. this is another reason why you're here cool. all right so let's talk now about um i sound like i was italian but so talking now i'm sorry <laughs> um let's talk about the song section so we have an intro, introduction, which sort of sets the scene for the story that's going to be told. The verse, which will probably come next, which is the storytelling portion of the song. The pre-chorus, sometimes used, but then we're most familiar with a chorus. And the chorus is that meaty part of the song that probably usually has the hook in it as well, you know. Um, that's that part of the song that we all burst out and start singing at the same time. And then the verse comes back and we're like, I don't know the words to this. And then the chorus comes back and we all know the words to that particular section. I had the solo section that would be for uh, the soloist to play a guitar solo or some other type of piano solo or something like that. And then a section called the bridge, which the bridge sort of takes us away from the other material that we've, that we've been experiencing in the song. It moves us to sort of a new, new area. It's related, but it's quite different than the other stuff usually. And then it's a way of pulling us back into the chorus again, and then an the ending or an outro. And this, we've, uh, we've heard this, this format, this particular format, hundreds and thousands of times um, because you know lots and lots of songs are, are laid out this way. So that's the sections of the song. And then we'll talk a little bit about song structure. And I guess I just kind of laid out a diverse chorus song structure. But generally, this is how it looks. And these sections can be labeled. And we'll do this in classical music as well, where we'll label the different sections of a piece of music by using just the letters of the alphabet. A represents the verse, B represents the chorus. The chorus is, uh, follows the verse, and then we have another uh, verse after the chorus. We hear the chorus again, then we move to um, the bridge, and then back to the chorus, and then perhaps end the piece of music. Um, but that, so that type of structure, um, just lends itself really well to um, our ears. And it's just a very familiar and comfortable pattern that we're all accustomed to. And when we're teaching music, teaching songwriting at York, again, we will find that students will just kind of, we won't even talk about the sections of music. They'll just start writing and we'll be able to show them later on. Wow, you created, you started with an intro. You did a verse followed by a course. Again, this music is so programmed in our brains already. So you have to know that if you are, if you're here and you're hearing these words, um, know that you can do this. Absolutely that you can do this. 
Um, there's, you have everything you need right now to write the best song you've ever written. <laughs> you have everything you need right now. Another form would be A, A, B, A. And I have a, just a, you know, a Beatles tune with this, that type of form, which is called 32 bar form. Um, kind of harkens back. I have a college essential that every student can use to make their work lives a little bit easier. And that would be Grammarly. I'm so sorry. Can we finish that? No, I'm not even gonna finish that. I was just gonna play a, a, a Beatles tune that had a 32 bar form. I'm gonna leave that out. Um, so um, yeah, well, let's, so let's get into the nitty gritty of, of, of the songwriting process. And I'm really gonna turn, I'm just gonna kind of interview Ben with this, with, with this idea. And then we'll open it up for a question and answer show, session after that. But Ben has written many, 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 many tunes. Can I play just some samples of your work here, Ben? You can find Ben on Spotify and iTunes. Let's, I'll just, and you'll, you'll hear that the, there's a really wide palette that he's got that he utilizes. Okay. See the clap. Thanks for your patience. Don't fear you have to run. So many things to do. It's just a matter of how you spend your time. And it's funny. Chapters of your story. Chapter one, the words will stop pouring out of your head. Chapter two, you question who got out of your bed. So, yeah. But I'm not sure you do. Let me escape to a place where your words can. I am tuning now all the noise till I hear instead playing the part it's not as easy as you say do you feel it soloing or improvising that line and his soloing is very lyrical as, as well and um, just to depart from it's all related but if we were to talk about jazz and jazz soloists who are impro improvising or even rock and roll players or for that matter country or bluegrass soloists on guitar that there is a when when lines are lyrical and melodies are present even with within the music that they're improvising in the moment. It's more memorable and um, aesthetically pleasing to listen to. So this idea of creating melodies that are memorable and easily digestible to our ears is a really, really important part of the process. Can you talk to us about your melody writing process or what maybe I should say, what comes first, Ben? Do you start with a progression, chord progression, or do you start with a melody or Lyrics, what, where does it, where does it come from? I think there's like, um, I don't cook too much, but uh, I know you have to separate dry from wet ingredients. And I don't know if it matters if you start your wet ingredients first or your dry ingredients, but it's like, as long as you have something to start with, hmm. the rest will come. So I don't think I have a set way Sometimes I'll have a, a lyric I think is cool. And then I'll say the lyric a bunch. And then it kind of has its own shape to that. Like your your voice naturally will go up or like go down. And then you can kind of like base your melody off that. Um, and yeah, and then a melody, um, if you have like 
an idea, like a, I don't know, something. You got to find words that like fit. You're not like squeezing too many words and it like makes sense with the amount of syllables. I'm big. I think you could honestly just take a number of syllables and that's how you start just with anything. I think syllables are really like lyrical, especially with language, like different languages. There's a different like your mouth is almost like a drum set at that point. You're like, you know, you have stuff in the back and the stuff at the front and it, like whatever's fun to say, I think that's a good lyric. Hmm. And then whatever's fun to sing is a good melody. And then when you have both, then it kind of becomes a hook. And, um, and yeah, going back to like the improvisation, I think the best like solos are just a, a plethora of hooks just being thrown at you. Mm -hmm. Just, just like thoughtful shapes. And when I say shape, like, um, happy birthday, I was thinking, I was like, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. There's like a shape to that. Um, and so, like, I, I used to draw out my shapes of melodies. Hmm. And then when I'm like, man, I'm really using this shape a lot, then I would just do the opposite hmm. pattern or just like invert it or something. But I think just it's it's not as nebulous as like it has to be, you know, mm -hmm. writing. Like you can just physically like see your your patterns and stuff. And um and then chords I think are really um fun. It can be hard because like talk about harmony and you take one note and you can have it in different contexts. Or or but it's the same note. This one is an A. Uh, that's in the context of an A minor seven. The context of an F chord, and then the context of an E chord. Okay, um, so that it's kind of like a pivot point for a chord, your note. Um, so if you have a chord progression going the other way, you're like, these chords are cool. Let's just do three. So the notes for those chords are G, B, D, and then E, G, B, and then C, B, G. So you kind of want to pick melody notes that outline those chords, or else you could get really dissonant ones. Um, like, that sounds kind of dissonant a little. Dissonant means that the notes fight against each other in ways that are kind of unpleasant to our ear. So, but you can kind of use that. Um, there's a thing, a big thing in music, uh, tension and release. Mm -hmm. There's a big thing in nature. And so you can set that up and then move it. And um, it's like asking a question and then giving an answer, antecedent consequence. Um, so. Add lyrics to that. Something like that. And then you kinda you kinda just take one idea and you run with it. You just sit with it. And that's how you get man, um, if you guys watch the Beatles documentary, uh, get back. Uh, it's kind of annoying, but Paul McCartney just like constantly was was just sifting it was like it was like watching a, an artist work with clay. It's just like, you're like, what is that? And then, and then it turned out to be Get Back, like the song. And so that idea of finishing something, you're going to have these moments of like, man, that's not good. Like, whatever. But like, that's 
that's going to happen. And that's why a lot of people don't become songwriters is because they get to that and they stop. But I would just say that that stops people from experiencing art yeah. in general. You know, you have the canvas in front of you and you have your paintbrush and you have your paints in front of you. And you, and you say to yourself, I'm not a painter. I can't do this. <laughs> and then when you put the paintbrush to the canvas and you put that first stroke, you're like, well, that's not what I intended. Obviously, I, I've just proven that I'm not a painter. And that's where most people would end up stopping. And then, you know, when we're five years old, we do that, we pop on the brush and canvas and we're like, oh, that's kind of interesting. I didn't know it was going to do that. <laughs> and then you're like, well, that kind of looks like a bird, doesn't it? And then you and then you kind of continue on. And I think what Ben is getting at is that, again, with this process, if you're here, you're listening to this, you're like, oh, it's not. Could I, could I do this? Yes. The answer is yes. That, you know, just using patterns, exploring some lyrics, singing some, some different shapes of notes. And again, there are all sorts of apps that you can use on your phone to just pull up some chords. Like there's a garage band on iPhones where you can press a button and you'll hear these really cool chords. And they're all laid out for you. And even in a row, you, you move from one to the next chord and, and you can start singing your own melody and, and incorporating your own lyrics to it. Yeah. Can you demonstrate to us like one of your songs, just like the, the process and then show us that song? Like okay. is there, like what, what came first, the chicken or the egg? The, the chord progression or the lyric? Okay, I just worked on one. Uh, I had these lyrics, really, I like, I was kind of sick of getting stumped at a song. So I chose part of the song as my project. So I really, it's a poem. I just like, I need to write a poem. And that's a great way to get in the lyrics. It's just writing a poem because then the like words in themselves have like pattern and shape and flow and then the notes are like they'll just come after so I had this poem and it's about um it's about watching a movie with your significant other and they, they pick the movie and it's just bad and then you tell them it's bad and it starts a fight and you're like man I shouldn't have said that because it's it's like it's just we spent time watching the movie that's all that matters it's not about the actual Anyway, so that was my poem. It's called Coffee is Cold. And so I had, coffee is cold. I'm distracted because I said something so stupid it can't be redacted. Um, blatantly honest until you reacted. Truth has been told and it can't be checked back to. So at the end, I needed to rhyme. And I kind of was like, well, I won't say fact check. I'll say check back to yeah. make it rhyme like it and and it's about saying the wrong words too so uh -huh. it's like oh it's justified so it kind of if you pick a theme for your poem you can get away with a lot more because people will be like oh that's justified i think sting is really good about that yeah. sting always has like a very clear theme in his lyrics and then he just adds in music and it's just like it's almost like background music for his screenplay or something <laughs> um so yeah, anyway, I had, I had my words and then I was thinking about hooks and catchiness. And uh, I was thinking of, you know, the song Call Me Maybe by Carly Rae Jepsen. It's like, um, uh, anyway. It outlines an arpeggio, which is very like that's a thing in nature. An arpeggio is just a broken chord. So you have a chord and you're playing the separate notes of that chord in succession. Yeah. And I after many years of research listening to pop music, a lot of hooks on the radio are arpeggiations of chords as the melody. So they're not even like distinct from the chord. They're really just outlining the chord. And they're, you know, they're making millions of dollars from that. So <laughs> it works, I guess. So I was like, I'll use some kind of arpeggiation stuff. So I had. 
That's my phrase, and I just like I took an arpeggio, and I plugged the words in, and I changed anything I saw fit. And this chord progression is kind of based on uh, my funny Valentine. It's got like this kind of walk down within it, so I knew I wanted that. In it, and I stole from a song. Basically, I drew heavy inspiration, and that's in like something. Something the way she moves. This walk down. Okay, so that could be a place to start. You just have a bass line, just a, uh, and then that one song. I'm feeling good. That's all you need. And that's, that's the intro, and yet that is such an effective hook right there for that. Can you, can you play your song one more time? Yeah. What you just, so we can hear that descending line in context. Yeah. It's a real so, tune. The is cold, You have a chorus to that yet? Yeah. Let's hear it. It's like a call and response thing. I ran out of ideas, so um, I did a call and response, but the response is on the instrument instead of another lyric. Mm. And it's really just the same thing. So it's the lyrics are raising my wrist to Jesus Christ. <laughs> Words were arranged in in on in in uh, in an unfortunate list. And that Two was like a walk down. In and un. Fortunate. Like I N A N U N. So that's like a word walk down I was playing with. Like yeah. it's kind of hard to say, but in and unfortunate list. It's like mouth opens up. So that's like a walk down in your mouth, not even happening on the instrument. Anyway, um, mm -hmm. it goes uh, raising my wrist <laughs> to Jesus Christ. Words were arranged Fortunate list And then the next part is Birds both agree The stone has missed Because I didn't kill two birds with one stone And mm. um, and then Words were arranged in unfortunate list So I took an idea and I, I repeated it To build familiarity um, So the whole thing is Raising my wrist To Jesus Christ Words were arranged, fortunate less. Birds both agree, the stone has missed. Words were arranged, fortunate less. Coffee's cold, It goes back. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I thought it was cool. It kind of broke up the flow of it a little. And... Again, I, I have no idea what I'm doing, so I'm just trying new things and um, always trying to do something different. Because I feel like once you get into a, a rhythm of your songwriting process, it's time to change it up. You're probably doing a lot of the same ideas. It's like if you wrote, if you were drawing a lot of flowers, you'd probably fall into some really similar movements, just like muscle memory stuff. Your muscle memory kind of um, impedes a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so, is that right? Yeah, it holds you into place. I, I totally agree. I would totally agree with that. And it, it's, I, I just love the, how he's going about this. I'm so proud that is there's such creative juices that are churning with that. The metaphors, the language, the, the, the humor, the depth of the, um, you know, of 
all of it, the, the progression and the melodic lines, all of those things are churning. And um, you as a first time songwriter, this is a very daunting you know, example, this, because Ben has been at this for a long time. Um, and, um, it, but it is, it's, it's, it's a fascinating process. And the, um, I wish we had, um, I wish we did more of this in our own, just teaching you know, music in school, more songwriting from the very beginning, because you can tell this process is just, it's so good at creating problems for yourself with regard to maybe a particular melody or lyrics, and now you've got to figure it out. No one, no one has that answer for you. This is something no one has ever done before. So you have to figure out the, pro the problem. It's not a worksheet where all the answers have been figured out. You have to, you know, now it's your turn to, to churn out those answers. This process of creating, you know, making yourself vulnerable and then just stepping into that vulnerability. And then that, in my opinion, helps you to develop the courage to do it again. And then when you develop that courage to go a little bit further and take a little bit further leap, it kind of allows you to take the next step. But I just read this book on creativity and that this process that Ben is going through, people are like, they're, they're repelled by the idea of being creative. It scares people. And we've done that to ourselves, I think. I think we've done that in, in, in a lot of you know, how we approach teaching school, in my opinion. And um, because when we come into the world, we're like, we don't know, we'll give it a go. And that's how we learn. And we're willing to, to build and try things. And so I would just say, as we you know, wrap this up into a question and answer session, my mantra to you is this. If you're here, you're listening to this, throw some lyrics down. Try to see if you can sing a little melodic line to something, a series of, of words that you've written. Um, explore some of the musical apps that you can find online that allow you to kind of play some different chords and arrange them in different ways that are pleasing to your ear. And then just experiment and, and, and put stuff together. Um, we, we absolutely have to stop convincing people that they're not artists. You know, when we're, uh, the analogy that I'll, I'll give is that I, pl I played peewee baseball when I was a little kid. I am still just an awful, awful athlete. Terrible. That's why I chose music. But I was on that field. I had the uniform on. I had my glove. And I was a baseball player. You know? And then from that moment on, I'm like, I'll watch baseball. And I'll see, wow, I was out on that left field. And wow, wow they, that was an amazing catch. I couldn't do anything like that. There's that appreciation that's built in just because they put the uniform on and, and went out there and you, you, you're a baseball player. I wish we could just do that with every single kid with regard to art and music. You are an artist, you're a musician. No, that's not reserved for somebody else that's got something that you don't have. You are wired for this creativity. You are wired to express with your hands. You are wired to express with your voice. We're, we're completely, we get this. That knowledge is already here. So again, just, you know, go for it, do it, write, experiment. Do we have questions either from uh, out in the, the... No, we don't have anything online, but if anybody wants to uh, type something in, if anybody has any questions here, just give me a, yeah. a hand and I'll walk over with the microphone. It's uh, great information. How do you like get started in a career uh, as a songwriter? Like, how do you get noticed? And oh, how do you well, question? I don't know. <laughs> this is, ben is trying to figure out how to get noticed with his music. And um, I'll, I'll say two words and then turn it over to Ben, but it's, it's connecting, you know, hustling, connecting. And go on, Ben. So tell us what you're doing right now. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, like, uh, well, for decades, like, um, people always just played other people's music. 
you know, like early pop music, some, like a team of writers would write and then it would be covered multiple times. Like, um, like even modern pop music now is not always the artist writing it. Um, so to have your own music, like you playing your own music and being paid for that is like top 0.01% probably of people. And um, the only way to do it is you, you have a huge catalog. So you're writing, really, you're writing like, it's your job. It's like you're writing a song a day. You're finishing a song a day or maybe two. And then um, a lot of people get started like with film or TV. Well, they'll, they'll submit their songs to be used for television and film mm -hmm. or even like, I don't know, like music for your instructional YouTube video, like mm -hmm. in the back or something. But just so you're getting traffic on your song. Um, and that's, I don't know, it's just a lot of exposure and like just persistence with it. And um, just you're always doing it. Like even our favorite artists now, I'm thinking like Dolly Parton or something. She's got a lot of hits, but she's written maybe 10 times, yeah, 20 times the amount of hits she has of songs you've probably never heard of. Um, and so it's really, it's like you write 100 songs, maybe one of them is like solid. Can I, real quick story? Yeah. So there was, supposedly there's a pottery class, okay? And this pottery teacher says, from one half the class, you will get an A if you just by the sheer number of pots that you create this class side of the class over here you will get an a for creating one really well constructed pot so just sheer numbers of pots versus really studying and carefully crafting the one pot well which side of the classroom actually ended up learning more and produced better quality work it was the people that just did sheer number and volume of, of, of pots. So this idea, like Dan is saying, write, 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 just keep blood, you know, just creating this huge catalog of work and then just learning from that, that process. And then I would just say, I, the world is, it's all about connections and don't be afraid to reach out to people that you might be truly intimidated by and just put it out there like, hey, I really like your music. Um, I would love for you just to listen to a couple of things that I've, that I've created and put it out there. And that's a real, there's a really natural process that will happen with regard to reaching out to people that you're scared about reaching out to. Either they don't get back to you, and if they don't get back to you, you probably wouldn't have connected with them very well anyway. And the people who do get back, you're like, that's a really, really special connection. I think a lot about that person. And there's potential for some, some cool connecting. With that I, I have a question that's for both of you. At what age did you realize that music is your life? I don't, well, I didn't know what my, I still don't really know what my life is, I guess. But I was like five when I was playing I watched a video of this baby eating ice cream for the first time and it took a bite and was like, oh my God. And it, and it just was, had the ice cream in his hands and it was all cold and it was just going for it. And like, <laughs> I feel like that was me when I was like five ish with probably before playing drums. Yeah. Um, but just kind of tapping into something and like just losing track of time and even where I was and I think that's when I knew there was like a, a very present greater power at play. And um, I'm not very good at other stuff. So I kind of kind of has to be my life. I help uh, pay my rent with music. So it just kind of what you want. There's this great athlete uh, cyclist. And he's like, don't don't try to fix your weaknesses. Focus on your strengths because, you know, everyone has their strengths and they're all different. And um, so just play to those and you'll have the most fun. I, um, I came from a pretty musical family too. And we're 
was playing music early on and just it just seemed to be a you know it was a bright a connection with it but with regard to ben like he was we always had a drum set guitars out i don't know if there's a moment where he doesn't remember not playing guitar i mean he, he just he, we have lots of pictures of him he's just a little tiny kid and he's fallen asleep on the chair with his or the couch with a guitar in his lap he's just it was always a part of his and I did that the other night in my apartment in Chicago. <laughs> I fell asleep and almost kicked my guitar off my bed. Um, yeah, but it's it becomes it's like a, occupational uh, hazard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, like you guys have pets. It's kind of like it's kind of that relationship. It's like you're you're nurturing the pet and you're feeding it multiple times a day and giving it love. Like it's gonna it's gonna feel good to connect with. Yeah. Did you have a question in the back? So earlier you had said how some people stop playing because they feel like they hit a wall and they're not able to produce good music. So they just like stop entirely. So how does it work for a singer that has like a pretty decent voice, but is never going to have like the voice of an angel and she can always practice and like work on her melodies. But does that mean that she's going to be an ultimately good singer? That's a great question. And that's, I mean, that is the beauty of, of art and creativity. It's that you think you have limitations, but those limitations force you to create your own style. So you're, if it's you that you're talking about or whoever we're talking about, it's those limitations that, that create, cause us to, to, to do the next cool thing. If you could just sing, in your head, if you are just like, I want to sing like an operatic tenor, then it's just right there. I can just do that. It, that does happen for a very select few people, but not everyone has that, has that ability to do that, which means you just have to like, your creative sense and urge will cling to a different aspect of what you can do. And then you, like Ben said, you work on developing that to the best of your ability. But it look related to like a jazz trumpet player, let's say, Maynard Ferguson, the trumpet player played really super high. And so he developed that and that's what he got known for. But when he played in the middle register, not that great a sound, you know, really, it was kind of not great. And other players that can't play super high, but maybe they've got a really sweet, mellow sound and so you may, they swim in that area. And that's that's the beauty of it. And, it. and again, is that our fault? Is that my fault as a music teacher where I didn't, I, I said that this is art. This is, if you can't do this, then you're probably not an artist. When it should be, you can't do that with it. If you're driven to, to sing and do something musical, then there's another route that is waiting for you to, connect with. And it's going to result in your own personal fingerprint. That's your unique style. And that's, that's the beauty of, of what art and creativity has in store for us. Is that it's ours. Now. It's not somebody else's polished, you know, presentation. It's our own, our own voice, our own, yeah, personal voice. I, I, more yeah, that. I don't know. I mean, like, Bob Dylan always played just like really simple chords. And I think if he had sat down and be like, I'm going to learn some jazz voicings and like, you know, get like branch out, I guess. I don't think his music would have been as true to him. And I don't think it would have sold as well. Um, so like, and I don't know. I think of Lady Gaga. And she started with the pop stuff and like developed in that way. And then it was only till like later she could go and like sing jazz like comfortably. But I, if she had started with jazz, I don't think she would be famous. Yeah. You know, she, she stuck to her strengths. And then later, like after, you know, after putting out so many pots, yeah. then she could be like, oh, that's how I got that one pot. I'm going to, that's my new goal for my next 
you know, 100 pots. And it's like, yeah, you're always developing. But if you're trying to develop too many things at once, then you you don't know where to go. Like, I think of board games. Board games aren't the amount of freedoms you have. It's the amount of limitations you have to deal that's with. That's interesting, yeah. Like, that's what's fun about soccer. Like, you know, you can't use your hands mm-hmm. or something. Right. And, um, and there may be, like, you know, if you were really to our, our world, you know, Vincent Van Gogh didn't make any money on any of his paintings. They were not, it wasn't, it wasn't popular. And yet he was following his own intuitive, personal voice to mix paint on the canvas and use gobs of it. And now they're priceless works of art. So yeah, that's a great question because we, we prevent ourselves from taking this creative road because we, we cut ourselves off before we take one step. No, I can't do that. So therefore, I must not have the talent to do it. Anyway. Another online question. Uh, who are the musicians who inspired you the most and why? I like Queen a lot. Probably my favorite band. Um, but like, they were just fearless with a lot of stuff. And they weren't afraid to um, draw influence from just like everywhere to the point that it was just, it was their sound. Like a lot of their songs are really like classical music um, influence and with like rock and roll and pop and stuff. And like, I don't think they thought anything of it at the time, which is why I think they're cool. They're just like, we like this, we're going to do it. And they got so much um, resistance from the label and stuff. Um, and they're, they're just like, oh, let's do it anyway. And then Chet Baker, to talk about a singer with limitations, his range is pretty limited. Mm-hmm. And he even will he'll solo in a different key. But then when it's time for him to sing, he'll switch it back to the key he's most comfortable with. So he's like manipulating it to fit his limitation and it's you don't think anything of it because it's just like this is beautiful Mm. um so chet baker and queen and um yeah those are my top three that's a good question um yeah that's that i actually have to think about that really um because it's as a band teacher and as a music teacher and and kind of like coming from different angles, just lots of kind of obscure references that I can make that no one would be like, who is that? <laughs> no, not that bad. Either. So, any other questions? No? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.